What's your best oh you thought this was bad, it gets worse story? This is a long one, but I promise it's worth it. A buddy of mine was cat sitting for a friend of his while the guy was out of town on a vacation. My buddy didn't have a car, so the dude told him that if he needed to go out and pick up more cat food or anything, he could borrow the car. At the time, my buddy was living right down the street from this guy, staying at his parents' house. So my buddy was just going over for a few hours each day to feed the cat and keep it company, then going back home. Meanwhile, he's also been flirting with this woman online. She lives several states away. But he feels like they seem to be getting pretty serious so he decides to take some liberties really push the envelope on where he'll pick up cat food from and he takes his friend's car on a little multi-state road trip this is insane right just atrociously bad judgment especially since someone does need to feed the cat to solve this he left his parents a note it read i am camping in the woods behind our house please go over to underscores and feed his cat i'll let you know when i'm home boom problem solved right except that the woods behind our house are about 20 yards deep. It takes less than 5 minutes to walk through them and come out into the neighboring housing development. So his parents went looking for him, calling out for him, and couldn't find him. They got word and contacted a family friend, a local police officer. He subsequently got a hold of the fire department. There was a full-on search party combing through about 1 50th of an acre of woods. Unsurprisingly, they were coming up with nothing. This was before cell phones were common. So my buddy was completely unaware that his plan had fallen apart. He was cruising along on his 12-hour drive, expecting to get to this girl's house just in time for dinner. Except he didn't have a GPS. So he got lost. Very lost. Like, by the time he turned up at this woman's house, it was almost midnight. When he got there, she was crying her eyes out. He assured her that it was okay. He was fine, wasn't hurt or in a wreck or anything. he just gotten lost. And she said, no, no. I wasn't worried about you. My dad just died in a motorcycle accident, so he bailed on his cat sitting duties, stole a car, and inspired his parents to file a missing persons just so he could awkwardly watch a woman cry for a few hours and then drive back home. Arrive home from work, my house reeks of oil, go in the basement, and there's a pool of oil, with my stuff floating in it. The oil filter on my burner rotted out, it was defective and recalled, but the tech never bothered to notify me or replace it. Call up the deck. He throws a new one one, charges me the emergency call fee, and advises I call home insurance before running away, it was his fault, I didn't know it yet. This was February in NY, about 13 F out, and obviously the burner wasn't on while sitting in a pool of oil, but, they get there pretty quickly soak it up, and get things running so my pipes don't freeze, only way to get the smell out is to dry clean everything I own, then shampoo all the carpets, run deodorizers etc. Takes weeks. Had a headache the whole time. Turns out, my basement has cracks. Most of it leaked through. They had to cut out my foundation and dig out the contaminated soil. Oil in soil means deck gets involved. Whole new can of worms as they now had to monitor the process. Test it every step. Big enough deal I have a spill number in their database. A 20 yard dumpster, with 20 yards of oil soaked sand, is so heavy that it broke through my driveway, destroying it. They did that twice, took out my entire driveway. Remember how I said this was in February? March brought the COVID shutdown. I spent over a year with my basement in shambles, holes in my driveway, plastic sheets taped up, no washer slash dryer, and all sorts of equipment kicking around. The next spring, they're back and working, and screwed everything up. Not going to get into every detail, but after a big fight, I managed to get rid of them and bring in a new company to fix their screw-ups and finish the job. Old crew got very difficult when the new crew requested permits and reports. Turns out, they never bothered. Had to do all that before they could start working again. New company dropped a storage crate on my yard to store my stuff while working. Destroyed my grass. Took out a sprinkler. Took out my neighbor's driveway curb. Got concrete all over my brickwork. But at least the nightmare was finally over. Teacher of mine had his car rammed by a construction vehicle with him just leaving. Twice. Then by another car, whose driver claimed he never gets into accidents while driving a car with multiple clear accident marks. Said driver then got pulled to court and had their lawyer give the shittiest testimony ever, contradicting himself at multiple points, even claiming hitting the other car was justified at some point. They got away with it. I worked with a guy who had previously dealt with 999 911 calls. He got very stressed out by it, so ended up getting a job spending a year looking after the ground for some gentry estate in Scotland to get over it. After that he came to work for us and its support for a while. He was really nice, 
really friendly, but he got stressed by everything remotely negative. If he couldn't solve a problem straight away it would throw him for a loop. He needed a smoke break every hour. We gave him the support we could as an employer, timeouts, pretty much what we could within reason but he wasn't really with it. Eventually he quit. I saw him a few times after that, always shaking, scared to cross the road even. His partner left him. The last I recall seeing him was him walking up the other side of the street. I called out but he didn't reply, and then he threw himself in front of a train. A work friend told me about a party where some of his friends decided to prank a mate of his. The target was one of the underdogs in the group, and he was often the butt of their japes. In advance of the party the pranksters jigsawed a hole in the top of a coffee table that was going to be thrown out. With a cloth thrown over it the coffee table looked fine. Anyway, when the party was well and truly underway at one point the host suggested they hold a seance. Everyone who was in on the prank agreed, and a large group of guests clustered round the coffee table where, unbeknownst to the intended victim, one of the guests was hiding, concealed under the table and the cloth. So the seance started and the host started intoning spookily. Something like, Eddie, exclamation mark. I hear a voice, Eddie, it's someone who knows you, Eddie. The guy at this point is wide and starting to tremble while the room is chuckling behind their hands. The voice wants you to go closer to the table so you can hear their voice, Eddie, closer, closer. Eddie is wide died with terror at this point and goes close to the table. At a signal, the guy hidden underneath the table stuck his arm up through the hole in the top of the coffee table as if a spooky form was rising up from the table surface under the sheet. Eddie flipped, I mean, Eddie freaked. While the room laughed he collapsed in tears, hyperventilating, screaming, sobbing, thrashing around. He was past inconsolable, it seemed like he'd lapsed into absolute psychological breakdown. And it didn't at all help when the prank was revealed to him, as he lay on the floor hysterical and literally inconsolable. One of the guests finally made the decision to call his mother, who was furious when she heard about the prank, because Eddie's father had passed away a few days before, and he hadn't told anyone. In the end it seems they had to call 999 and a medic arrived who sedated him. I don't know if he went in for observation or was allowed home, but you can bet that the hosts got grounded and ass kicked by parents left, right, and center after word got round. DL. Doctor meet an old lady walking her dog, things go downhill from there. This was about, 6 or 7 years ago, I think. It was a hot summer day. I enjoy the heat so I decided to go on a nice long walk. I was going to a movie later on and I wanted to soak up the warm sun before I had to sit at a cold theater for a few hours. As I'm walking a trail a mile or so from my house, I come across an old lady with a worried expression walking a shih tzu. She asks me where her retirement home was and I look it up on my phone. It's over 4 miles away. She'd been walking in the 90F 32C weather for over an hour without any water or sunscreen. The poor dog looked completely haggard. After asking her a few questions I was able to determine a few things. She has dementia or was suffering from heat stroke, didn't know the date or the current president. Her family was visiting and she decided to take their dog for a short walk, which ended up with her getting lost. She didn't have a cell phone or any way of contacting someone. Well fuck, thought I, I didn't want to call the police and turn this into a big thing, mistake on my part. I know, so I checked the dog's collar and found a phone number. But wait, it gets worse. The phone number wasn't any of the visiting family. That number actually belonged to the ex-wife of the old woman's son. As it turns out, they had a nasty divorce. The ex-husband apparently stole the dog and blocked all contact with her. At least, that's what I was able to tell from the woman on the phone who was screaming at me to return her shih tzu. I eventually hung up and called the police. I had to make a statement before leaving but I assume everything got worked out. The ex-wife kept blowing up my phone during that entire process and I had to block her so she'd stop harassing me about her dog. But wait, it gets even worse, the whole experience ended up draining me so I called off my movie plans. Which is where I discovered it was actually a date and the guy ended up exploding at me and calling me a bunch of bad names. That was a weird day. A long time ago I had a relationship that ended badly because she cheated. We were engaged. I tried to make it work but the stress and lack of trust was too much for me and I wound up having a breakdown and wound up in a mental hospital. They diagnosed me with schizoaffective disorder. Turned out she was pregnant and hadn't told me. I had no idea she had had a kid. Three years later she committed suicide. I hadn't spoken to her since the day I left. My mother however found out from my ex's sister. At the time my mother had power of attorney over me because she was the one that had me hospitalized. So she had me declared unfit and fished my daughter out of the foster care system and adopted her herself. Except my mother never fucking told me. She raised her as my adopted sister. 
and even told me she was the granddaughter of a high school friend. It wasn't until she was a teenager that I found out, and only because my mom had a big folder of paperwork on my sister laying on the table. One of the papers had her birth mother's name on it. My sister is in her 20s now and still doesn't fucking know. I can't tell her because I'm not supposed to know either. For a long time I debated taking all this to court, but I figure I would have lost anyway. When my mom's gone I'm probably gonna tell her. This shit still brings me to tears thinking about it. She was only 3 but she was in the room when my ex hung herself, and she thinks it was her birth aunt. 21st birthday drinking story. It's a bit of a read but the left turn is worth it. For people that live outside of the states. When you turn 21. Legal drinking age, there is a small 2 hour window from turning 20 to 21 at midnight before bars stop serving where you can drink. Anyway, few of my buddies wanted to have a good time and take me out. My mother told me to swing by the house around 4 pm after my night out and we'd be going out for an family dinner. My stepfather was going to a poker game with his brothers and would crash at his place. Little brothers all had sleepovers, so I get picked up by my friends. Sure as shit have a great time. Woke up feeling like 5 pounds of shit in a 2 pounds bag though. Thought food for sure. Ring up my ma who says to swing by my stepdad isn't home yet. Buddies drop me off. Stepdad isn't answering his phone calls, texts etc. My uncle whom he went to play poker with said he never had a poker game. Calls go out to all family members. My aunt has a friend that was a cop so she calls. Stepdad was found about 40 miles away from home in jail for trying to pick up a 14 year old girl from the internet. So here I sit, hungover, hungry. My little brothers are bawling their eyes out. My mother is losing her mind. Then my aunt says to turn on local news. Sure as shit and true to catch a predator form we see my stepfather walk into a house and get slammed against the wall by a handful of cops. 222 men caught in the sting total. Now out of these 222 men can you guess which one was willing to go on television and talk about getting caught? Fucking a right. My stepdad of course. Within the next 3 hours phones would either be blowing up with texts or calls. Everyone at my job knew cause I worked with my stepdad. Few days pass and my mom goes to the bank to get cash for bills, good, gas, etc. Found out he drained the account the day after getting arrested to pay for his lawyer. Stepdad gets fired while in lockup. So now it's me at 21 working for 10. Oh oh an hour now supporting a family of 4 including myself. Mom files for divorce, few weeks go by. He's out on bail living with his parents cause he can't come home yet cause there are minors present in the home. Police show up about a week later asking if I have alibis for a handful of dates. Turned out he would on occasion pretend to be me when chatting with young girls online. 1600 plus pages of AIM chat logs recorded with various people pretending he was me. Thank Christ the dates in question I was either with family that could confirm or I was at my other job electronically punched in. I get cleared. He finally gets convicted and sentenced to a whopping one and a half years in prison. Ended up losing our house. My two jobs. Had to briefly move out of state for a while. One day, my partner and I are at a tacky little beach town, you know, fast food, lots of donuts and sweets, that kind of thing. Up until this point, I have enjoyed normal and absolutely non-disastrous digestion. Don't have any food triggers, no gastrointestinal problems, nothing. I suppose this day was the day that God decided to punish me for my hubris. It begins on the way back to the train. I still consider the universe merciful that it happened then, and not as the train pulled away. It's early in the evening, so busy but not too bad. Despite having never really experienced the warning bubble gut before in my life, some instinctive, evolutionary part of me recognizes it for what it is. I tell my partner I have got to find a bathroom. Thankfully, she is the kind of person who always notices the bathrooms, and we're not too far away from a public toilet. Spoiler, I do actually make it on time. I dash in there, thankfully finding a stall empty and lock myself in. What followed is too painful to talk about. I was humbled before God. All I could do was grip the toilet with both hands and desperately try to distract myself trying to work out what had caused this misfortune before me. Thankfully I have the presence of mind to reach behind me every so often to courtesy flush. It occurs to me then that I can hear voices. Women's voices. Jesus Christ. I'm in the women's bathroom and I'm absolutely destroying it. I guess in my panic I missed any warning from my partner and also the complete lack of urinals. There is literally nothing I can do about it right now, though, and to be honest it's the least of my worries. I endure this torture for around 20 minutes before it finally begins to taper off. I sit there for a while, suspicious, but it seems to be done. My gut still feels a bit weird, but whatever. It was literally just exposed to weapons grade chemicals. I can hardly blame it. Then I hear a timid voice from the entrance to the bathrooms. It's my partner, calling to see if I'm alright. The room goes deathly silent, 
I think some people may have noticed that I'd been in there for a while and are probably trying to be nosy. I can hardly reply. So I sit in awkward silence. It's unbearable. But not as unbearable as the absolute cacophony of noise my ass decides to make at that moment. It's like percussion and trumpets all in one. There is nothing I can do but sit there with my face in my hands. I hear various sounds of disgust and a few spatters of laughter. My partner, realizing the futility of her mission, retreats. Fast forward 10 more minutes, and I think I'm ready to begin cleaning up. Only, there's no fucking toilet roll. I mean, there's maybe like, 3 squares of it left and I am in quite the state. I have no idea what to do. There are still people coming in and out of the bathrooms, so I can't even shuffle my shameless way into another stall. I don't see any other choice, though. I mean, what am I supposed to do here? I wait until it's completely silent outside, and then I gather my trousers up as close as I dare and bolt. I'm in an adjoining stall when the main door opens. I slam the door closed and lock it. Footsteps pass. They go to the stall I was just in. I've been courtesy flushing, but you know, there's still some evidence. I hear this poor woman swear. Who does that? She asks. I try to psychically let her know how sorry I am, but at least there's toilet roll here. Finally, the deed is done. I'm ready to emerge into the world. My asshole feels like it's been done in with drain cleaner, but I'm mostly alive. I text my partner and ask her to act as lookout, and she makes sure the coast is clear so I can quickly go and flush the afflicted stall I just abandoned and also hurry out and try to wash my hands as thoroughly as possible in the limited time I have. Success. I manage it. We hurry to the door, and immediately run into several mothers with their push chairs. There's no way past them. We have to stop dead. We all look at one another for a moment, and you can see the conclusions they're jumping to. The indecency. My partner being the whore of Babylon, etc. This is not a classy area as it is. By this point I need you to know that I'm exhausted and ill and damn near tears and I just can't stand the lecturing this might cause. We just shuffle past and I look so ashamed that I probably back up every single one of the notions they had. We manage to catch the train an hour late and every slight vibration in the track is agony for at least half of the way home. Never did find out what set me off, especially as my partner and I had the same food all day. Then again that might not be a fair comparison. This woman is even immune to deli belly, DL. Doctor ate something weird and answered before God via a sequence of almost slapstick comedic occurrences in the women's bathroom. My dad was cheating on my mom with a woman a year younger than me, 22, when he was mid-40s. Christmas time, he's sitting in church next to my mom crying, but won't tell her why. Younger brother knows dad is cheating and thinks maybe the side piece broke up with him and so confronts him. Turns out girl died in a car crash was headed to Honduras for a college class. Had to take anti-malaria pills for a few days before going, and take a pill every day of the trip. Fine the first two days on the pill, we all leave to the plane, get to the airport, get on the first plane. By the time we got off we had an hour to get to the connecting flight halfway across the airport. Stomach starts rumbling. I think I'm just hungry. Get on the plane. I'll seat next to the kindest couple I've ever met. Introductions. Then we start the three hour flight. And that's when I realize I have to shit bad. I couldn't get to the bathroom. The entire class of 20 plus college students all had to piss so I just lean back. Hopeful they'll be done soon. They aren't done soon. Half an hour until the plane lands. And I start getting airsick. I grab a barf bag. The sweet wife is rubbing my back and telling me it'll all be okay. We're landing soon. And I realize I am not. In fact, airsick. My shits were so bad I was about to throw up. Eventually, plane lands. We're on the ground. Then we're told there's a 15 minute delay and to sit in our seats. I'm literally crying at this point. The poor lady I just met is doing her best to comfort me. Still thinking I was just a bit airsick. We finally are able to get off the plane. I had to grab my 40 pound bag, full of scuba gear, and my backpack. I swear I left a dust cloud and jumped over the last 5 steps of the external plane dock. Get to the bathroom. Diarrhea all over some poor rinky airport bathroom. And then notice there's no toilet paper. And it's a weird foreign toilet no water in the bowel. I pray to nine different gods, flush, and leave with no dignity. And discover there's a massive line for the passport area. I'm last in line. One of the professors had to scoot back past 50 people to stand with me and one or two other classmates. Customs goes fine. We're about to get on the bus to the resort. And I feel the rumblies. A 45 minute bus ride later. We get told which beach huts are ours. I get the last one in line. It's a good mile walk. I waddle my way down with the five other girls in the beach villa, trying to act natural. A guy drives past us on his golf cart, offers us a ride. I jump on. Turns out there are lots of potholes on the gravel road, and I nearly shit myself all over my doormates for a week. We finally get to the villa. Everyone is checking it out, taking their sweet ass time. There were a lot of flamingos, 
If anyone happens to know which resort we were at, bright pink everywhere. We finally get inside. I fly to the bathroom, sit down, and discover it's an open-air villa. The walls are 8 feet high, but above that is open air. Everyone can hear me as I christen the toilet. And there's no toilet paper. Again. Finally finish. Walk of shame to grab my bags. Turns out they lost my main suitcase somewhere between me putting it on the bus and getting to the resort. I have to go to the 12 or so other villas. Knocking and asking if anyone has seen my duffel bag and huge blue suitcase. Nobody has. So I go to the main office. Mile walk and all. Rumblies start again. Of course. I beg a ride on the luggage golf cart. Which by some miracle had my shit on it. The nice worker takes me back to the villa and sweet. Toilet paper free. Relief. The I get out of the bathroom. And find out someone overbooked the villa. It was me and five other girls. There were two single beds and a king bed in the master. The girls pair off. Three taking the master. Two others taking a single bed each. I volunteer to sleep on the wicker couch. Set my shit up. No blankets or pillows. After an hour of raiding the closets we discover Ome. One. Thin pillow and a scratchy wool blanket. So everyone tosses me one thing off their bed a pillow from one of them. A thicker blanket from another. The girls in the king bed toss me two pillows and a second blanket. After all this I realize I have to take my malaria meds. And put two and two together. I am severely allergic to them. So after a shitty day. I discover I have two weeks in a malaria infused country with no anti-malarials. And I attract mosquitoes like your hillbilly uncle Henry collects felonies. The end. Right? Nope. Turns out the nights on Roatan are windy as fucking cold to boot. And guess who was in the living room? With the entire wall facing the ocean being made of slate doors? Spent the night cuddled up on a couch that I don't fit on. Being 6 feet 3 inches. Praying I avoided tomorrow's shits. And yes, it did get worse from there. But this comment is long enough already. I'll just say it had a lot to do with severe seasickness and a kindly Honduran captain who rubbed my back. Called me baby and honey. And hand fed me watermelon so I wouldn't dehydrate while dry heaving over the edge of his boat for 2 hours. Bless him. DLDR, nearly shit myself in a plane.